Welcome to the Low Carb MD Podcast. No one is beyond help. No one is beyond hope. Nothing said on the Low Carb MD Podcast is medical advice. Please consult your own doctor before making any lifestyle changes. Hello and welcome back to the Low Carb MD Podcast. This is a special one for me, Tro. This guy, I'm telling you, over the since 2020, I've lost so much respect for so many doctors I've worked with. I actually had to sit down with this character in San Diego, and he goes, Brian, there's big stuff coming, but I can't really tell you the details of it. Uh, we had coffee. I think he had tea. And uh, I was mind blown because I knew his initial stance, and I was like, huh, this is interesting. He goes, I have to look at the data. I have to like really be solid in what I'm saying before I make a public statement. And then I watched what happened after that. I was like, wow. Very few people kept their word. Very few people had the courage to go public. We had a lot of people calling me and Utro behind the scenes to say, yeah, we agree with you, but we can't say anything. And that the I, and I'm so excited to have him because he's done so much great work and he's been there. I mean, you go through the fire. I mean, that's what builds character. And this guy has been through the fire and getting attacks and man, to stand up to that, like it is brutal, brutal stuff. So it's a total honor for me to have him. Tro, you want to do some intro on your side? Oh, absolutely. I'll tell you, um, you know, Dr. Seema Holtra is our guest today, and I, you know, I'm like the biggest fanboy. You know, I got to be honest. Here's his book right here. It sits in my bookshelf, Stratton Free Life. You probably know his book, Piopi Diet, mm. um, from uh, 2017. He has published more papers than I know about, and all the papers are challenging the convention. Um, and starting back in, in the early 2000s, mid-2000s, uh, he's been challenging the narrative on nutrition, challenging the narrative on statin overuse. And most recently, you know, unfortunately, after the uh, untimely passing of uh, his father, uh, he's been talking about the uh, the regulatory capture around our vaccine industry, which is a very controversial topic. And all throughout these, all of these are controversial topics but he runs towards controversy with uh, such bravery and courage. And I'm not just blowing smoke. He gives me courage to say what I say. Uh, he gives the other doctors in our profession who are a little bit concerned about what their institution will say maybe, or what their central regulators will say maybe. Um, but his bravery in and the courage in the face of and then a lot of social pressure, it's it's contagious. And I told him this during the pandemic. I said, I just want to let you know, you give me courage, even though he faced a lot of heat from within our own, you know, metabolic movement. And his new documentary, you guys all have to go watch it. First, do no farm. Uh, go to the website. We'll put the link in the uh, website. Go get it. Go watch it. Uh, and it paints this narrative all the way back from, you know, the, the cholesterol trials through the nutrition scandals, all the way to data that we've known about that reverses heart disease. So I'm going to stop my monologue because you all don't want to hear from me and Brian. You want to hear from Dr. Maltra. I seem, I can't be, you know, I, I got to be honest with you. When I, I met you, still starstruck. You know, I had to hide my wife. You're so good looking. I was like, no, you can't meet him. You know, <laughs> you can't meet him. You know, no, I'm just kidding, Rosette. Um, listen, I'm I'm just happy to have you here. No, thank you for that. I'm. It's very kind of both of you to with you know to say those things. But I think what I would say um, in response to that, um, Tro and and Brian, is that I see myself just as a a medium for a message and the sum of my influences. And we are all, you know, in this together, really. And, uh, you know, to, to try and get to a greater truth, but primarily motivated by what we signed up for as doctors is to, you know, our responsibility and duty primarily is to patient, improving patient outcomes, improving their health. And, uh, and that's all we're trying to do at the best we can. You know, I, I'd like to go back before we, we talk about the documentary, uh, I'd like to go back because, um, you know, I, I know, and you've, you've been very vocal about this and you've even published about it, um, the impact uh, your parents had on you and, and maybe how you got to medicine. I'd love to start there. 
You know, uh, what was the fire that brought you to medicine? Did you always have this passion? Were you always the guy who saw injustice and ran towards, you know, ran towards hostility, ran towards danger? Were you always the person that, like, what was the person who decided I'm going to go to medical school? Wow, yeah. that's a great question. So uh, just a bit of background to answer that question, um, you know, comprehensively, Troy. I think, you know, I, so I grew up in, in greater Manchester, in the north of uh, England, in the UK. Both my parents were general practitioners. They were immigrants from India. They left India in the late 70s. I was born in India, but I was a year old when they came across with me and my older brother who had Downs. He was he was three years old at that stage. And, um, you know, they uh, brought me up with a very strong sense of doing the right thing, your, your primary duties to the community. They were both amazing, you know, parents, very loving, very kind parents. I think to some degree as well, having a child with Down syndrome or me having a brother, I think that obviously definitely shaped us in many ways. Um, he was quite severely affected, so he needed full care and attention. So I think that definitely brought out a more compassionate side in us. And my dad himself, and maybe this is where I get some of that kind of sense of fighting injustice, he himself was a very strong political student leader he was put in jail twice by the Indian government, Indira Gandhi, for calling out government corruption when he was already a qualified doctor, leading marches, that kind of stuff. And in fact, one of the main reasons he left India, he was told basically that he needs to get away for a while for the heat to die down. And, um, and then when he came to the UK, he was so fascinated by the NHS, he just fell in love with this, you know, he thought was an amazing system that basically gave good quality care for free to everybody. So that was one thing, and he he loved working in that system. But also, I think what he realized when he came to the UK is that um, with having a child, a disabled child, there wasn't really any good infrastructure in place in India that would look after children with special needs. And he was really impressed with the system in the UK. So I think that kept him there, always wanted to go back. And then for me, you know, I was, uh, you know, my dad, I mean, there's so many different facets to my personality that probably explain who I am and what I do. But... My father got into medical school on a sports scholarship. He had a very humble beginnings. He was, you know, eldest of five kids. He said he didn't even have shoes until he was 11 years old. So there was a very strong sense of humility and like, you know, um, realizing that, uh, you know, we, we have to make the best with what we have, but also understanding people who are from deprived and underserved backgrounds are generally very good people, but are victims of, of, a, of a kind of failed system that keeps them almost in a state of, of oppression, to be honest. I mean, we'll come on to that later because I still think that's ongoing, although it's it's gone further up the the, the socioeconomic hierarchy. So, um, you know, he uh, brought me up with that sense of injustice and uh, all, all these tackling injustice. And of course, the most prominent thing growing up in the UK, Tro, as, a, as an immigrant, and this doesn't happen so often anymore, I think it's a bit more subtle, but not so overt, is that we experienced a lot of racism. I got attacked by neo-Nazis um, playing in the local park. I would be scared of leaving my house with my parents who wanted to just go shopping on the weekend because I knew we were going to get called racist, you know, we'd be called names. And it wasn't just about that. It was my dad was the kind of guy that wouldn't um, back down. A lot of people would just say, let's stay quiet. Let's just go home. He, If there was 10 guys shouting racist chants, my dad would be ready to fight with them, like get in a fist fight. He was that kind of guy, right? <laughs> So I think I saw a bit of that. And um, and then he was also, he got a sports scholarship. I was very sporty and he wanted me to be a, um, there's a game called cricket. You might be familiar with it, which is a, a religion in India, very popular in the, in England. It was, you know, it, that's where it came from. And he wanted me to be a professional cricket player. And I, and I played a lot of competitive sport. I played soccer, I played badminton, tennis, but that was the one where I could have potentially even played, you know, nationally or or whatever else. And then I decided when I was sort of 16, 17, that I wasn't going to be, you know, the, the equivalent of Cristiano Ronaldo in soccer for cricket. A guy called Sachin Tendulkar, I thought, okay, I'll pursue a career in medicine. So I think that's definitely, um, you know, uh, that gives me that kind of um, slightly competitive, uh, maybe uh, spirit a little bit to me um, and, and leadership. I captain sports teams. So I had all of that there and, you know, was the kind of guy that we would win matches often, not because we were more talented, but because we psyched out the opposition. And I was the guy involved in psyching out the opposition. And, you know, being an opening batsman and taking, you know, bounces, these balls being delivered at 100 miles an hour almost, you know, about almost at your head. 
So, you know, and then trying to like weather the storm before then going on the attack. So there's a little bit of that in part of my nature, I think. Mm -hmm. um, and then I started writing for the school newspaper. The first article I ever wrote when I was uh, 16 was about tackling racism and our school newspaper became the national school newspaper. It got the national school newspaper of the year award. And, um, you know, I had teachers come up to me and I made this comment in there, which was quite controversial at the time. And I said, racism is in each and every one of us. But combined with our inherent propensity to, for violence, that racism can be utterly devastating. And I was very candid talking about that. Um, and the teachers came, a few teachers came to me and said, well, this great article scene, but oh, what do you mean racism meets everyone? I said, well, this is part of you know, human nature to some degree. We have to fight it. It's part of um, our primitive animal brain. So anyway, I think you know, that's where I, I always had that kind of um, sense of injustice since I was a kid. And then, of course, I you know went to medical school. I uh, was definitely interested in the science. I was particularly fascinated by cardiology. My older brother died when I was eleven. Um, he had a crashing heart failure within five five or six days of getting a stump tummy bug, which we then realized was viral myocarditis. And I had that interest in cardiology anyway. And then I decided to just pursue that when I was at medical school, uh, which, as you know, was, you know, I wasn't, I was naturally pretty good. Luckily, you know, at school, I never got a B grade. I was straight A's all the way through, despite the fact that I was playing lots of sports. And I never really worked that hard at medical school, I'll be honest with you, Tro. I didn't work that hard at medical school. I scraped through my medical exams, literally scraped through, because I was doing other things. I was playing in a rock band. I was like a guitarist. I was just, I didn't, and interestingly, only after I qualified, when I realized if I want to do cardiology, it's super competitive. You've got to then like be top, you've got to get top marks in the in the postgraduate examinations. I was like, okay, now I need to study. So I only really started studying properly with passion and intent in my life after I qualified as a doctor. <laughs> so I could become a cardiologist. So you so had this, that motivation to be at that top level and you had to do that. Like I know how competitive it was. That's why I'm not a cardiologist. <laughs> well, you're you're also you had that competitive spirit sort of in with in with you before and you had that uh uh ability to to fight, you know, injustice despite maybe the odds not being in your favor. I mean, you saw that you saw that exhibited, right? You saw your father sort of, you know, had no fear or very little fear and or be at least be able to tame the fear, and it just sounds like you probably, uh, you know, uh, uh, learned that, or or maybe it was passed down. And then, yeah, and, uh, and on that, and, and Troy, you'll you'll understand this as a doctor. On that as well, one of the things that happened, which I learned, you know, uh, in as a teenager and as an early adult, is my father became a general practitioner, but that wasn't what he wanted to do. He primarily wanted to be a pediatrician, but he was an immigrant doctor working the NHS, and he got told very blatantly by seniors because you're an immigrant, you know you're not going to get those best jobs. The best thing you can do is become a GP. So I realized, I was, and he obviously wanted me to not have, wanted me to have more opportunity, but he said a seam and I had people say to me, and it sounds strange. I, I think things have changed a lot, Tro. I mean, there's still a big problem with institutional racism in the NHS, there's no doubt. I mean, there's been reports on this, independent reports on this, but basically there was, I was advised by, you know, my one of my dad's friends who got into cardiology ultimately, he said a seam, you've got to be that much better than your white counterpart to get that job. So I, when I realized that, I was like, okay, I need to really push really hard here. So I think there was a bit of that too. I think things are a lot better now. But um, yeah, that probably spurred me on as well. You know, yeah, and the other thing that strikes me, sorry, Tro, uh, the thing that strikes me is too about your dad. Like most of us, like if I'm in your dad's situation, I just go, you know what? I'm not going to commit to these guys. I'm just walking the other way and being quiet and protecting my family, right? So you had way more bullies than that after you, you know, at some point. And, and that's why, I mean, I lost a lot of respect for doctors because the bullies came out and they hid, they hid. And we wonder what happened. I don't want to get too, too in depth here, but what I was thinking about is I have German heritage and I was thinking the Germans, they just sat there and go, look, I'm not putting my neck out for someone else. I'm just going to like, just put my head down and walk away and not say anything. And that's what we saw in medicine. The doctors just put their heads down and looked the other way. And no one was saying anything about what they were seeing in clinic. Right. And so that's that it's such a hard thing. I mean, it takes a lot of courage to stand up to the bullies that are after you, especially when they're idiots and you know that they don't know what they're talking about. That's the hardest part. Yeah. But I think I think the courage also comes, Brian, from a, an in-depth in knowledge and understanding of why these people are behaving the way they are. And I'm, it's really interesting you brought this up because um, I read a paper uh, and 
I'll try and send it to you later, you know, to read yourself. It was fascinating. It was in one of the Israeli public health journals and it was written before the pandemic. I think it was 2017. And it was actually called Lessons from the Holocaust. And they brought together in, in Israel, uh, doctors, academics, um, teachers, medical students, for this convention to talk about what was the, and I was shocked when I read it. I was honestly shocked because I think this is an untold story. What was the role of the medical profession in Germany in the Holocaust? And one of the stats that came out was that, um, you know, I think it was something like 45% of doctors joined the Nazi party versus 7% of teachers looking at people who were in public service, right? That was one thing. But one of the things they put in there, because the reason there were lessons of, from the Holocaust is that basically they said they suggested that the a Holocaust would may not have even happened without the complicity of the medical profession in Germany, who were, you know, indoctrinated to to believe and then disseminate this idea that Jewish people were a threat to public health, right? And therefore they needed to be sidelined and it happened very slowly. They got rid of doctors who were Jewish, first of all, then they started the sterilization process. They did it for other, for, you know, for disabled people and, and other, you know, immigrants as well. And one of the lines from this, which just, uh, you know, um, may explain what you just said, what happened in, to some degree in terms of the, the mindset. They say that doctors and the medical profession is hierarchical and obedient which is a risk factor, a risk factor for abuse of power. Absolutely. Yeah, that's how you get cults. That's how all these things, when you don't question and when they, they put their thumb on you for questions, say, Hey, I have a question. I don't understand why I'm seeing this. <laughs> Can you explain it to me? And they, they censor you or blackball you. And I had, a, I experienced that also. So yeah, it, it, there's so much of this story, but I think people need to understand that the mindset because like yes. Tro says, we just keep obeying the doctors just say, well, that's what they said to do. We just, we're just following orders instead of saying, well, are these orders working? Yeah. I, I want to, I want to like stay on this topic here for a little bit because, you know, the average listener, I think the three of us understand exactly what you're talking about, but imagine, you know, for you, it seemed it was easy to get into medical school, but imagine you had to struggle, you had to study to get in medical school, you felt like it was your own merits that got you there, then you get to medical school, you're the lowest one on the totem pole, right? And then you were told to just do as you're instructed, you're, you know, overstudied, and really, uh, it's a it's sort of a hazing experience, you become an intern where you're the lowest on the totem pole, you do yeah. that for two years, then you go to residency where you're the lowest on the totem pole, you have intern year in the United States, and you have a residency program where you may be the lowest on the totem pole for another two to eight years. And then you yeah. go on to fellowship where you're still not even, you know, an attending. And so, and, you know, the, the mantra in medicine is sort of see one, do one, teach one. You have to observe what your uh, uh, seniors are doing and follow them. And at any point, you know, if you step out of line, you can get kicked out of a program, either school, and then you'll be all that effort, all that, you know, everything that you put in uh, to get there, you know, could be literally evaporated if you're, you know, that authority figure doesn't like you or you step out of line. So I think it's a combination of that arrogance that like I had to work to get here. And it's also a bit of you know, uh, just accepting authoritarianism yes. as the primary education modality. And then you end up with people, you know, which you talk about in the documentary, pushing statins, pushing unnecessary medications, you know, pushing antibiotics, maybe when it's inappropriate, pushing, you know, antidepressants when it's inappropriate, pushing, you know, vaccines, maybe even when it's inappropriate. Yeah. And, and I think Ross Walker in the documentary, the cardiologist sums it up quite nicely. There are too many people in medicine climbing up the wrong wall to success. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah. You know, absolutely. So, so I, you know, I just, so now you become this cardiologist. I still want to go back, you know, mm. we're sort of leaving, we're doing the Trump weave. Uh, but, uh, mm -hmm. you know, you're, you, you, you go to, you know, um, you go through medical school, you become a cardiologist. Yeah. At what point do you start to sense that something is wrong? Right. Something yeah, is wrong. You know, at what, what point does yeah. that happen? Yeah, it's really, really good question. So I think going back to medical school as well, thinking about that mindset that we were all at as well, Tro, uh, the three of us, is that um, what you were taught, you were led to believe to be an exact science, right? I mean, that's one of the ways I think that 
you know, where there's a big limitation or barrier for us to be the best possible doctors we can be is this myth that medicine is an exact science when it's not. It's an applied science. It's a social science, science of human beings. But we're taught in medical school, you know, pathways for whatever the Krebs cycle or blood pressure is a risk factor, lower the blood pressure, all these sorts of things, right? You know, complicated stuff in a lot of detail. And we, and we, and we, we get that becomes part of who we are. And I was one of those people, right? And, uh, but, you know, I decided obviously to, to pass my postgraduate examinations. I think the one thing, I don't throw the baby out of the bathwater. I think the one thing we're very good at and we're taught to do well and where we and we work hard and learn a lot of stuff that makes us good at doing this, Tro, is being diagnosticians. I think doctors are taught very well to make, to diagnose disease. So, um, and that comes from understanding biochemistry, physiology, but more important than anything else, being a good history taker. Being able to, you know, 80% of your diagnosis comes from the history. In fact, that has, in many ways, and I see this a bit more in the American system, and, and it's happening more and more in the UK, is that those basics are being lost, right? And you start then organizing tests for people who have got clearly musculoskeletal chest pain, and it's clearly not cardiac, like, what, what are you doing, right? So, so we're taught to be very good diagnosticians, but where the limitation is, and this is where my, my journey kind of starts, is we are not... Um, I think there are three components I've identified, which are, I think, a major limitation to modern medicine right now. I need to change. We're not good at root cause analysis, right? A lot of these conditions we're taught about high blood pressure, type 2 diabetes, chronic, irreversible, just one of those things, right? Not understand the root cause. We're not taught and empowered, uh, taught to empower patients and to advise them on lifestyle changes that can manage those conditions, get them off their pills, send them to remission. And the third, last but not least, is we are not good at communicating health statistics and even understanding them to engage in true informed consent. When you put all those three to things together, you can see how healthcare is, 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 is not meeting the standards we would expect to generally, you know, improve people's, uh, how, patients' health outcomes. For me, I think the, the, there were a few moments that all kind of came together within the, within a short space of time, probably within, I think a few years, I think, one of them, if I remember, when I was a senior house officer, so this would have been, I would have been now, um, this would be, I qualified in 2001. In 2003, I had a job, a placement for six months in one of the London teaching hospitals doing endocrinology and neurology. And as you know, you know, there's always some kind of weekly education session and you go for a lunch and often, by the way, sponsored by the drug industry, right? A drug industry Almost lunch, always, giving yeah. you a talk. And there was this guy um, called Raymond McAllister. He was at UCL, ph clinical pharmacologist, very senior guy. And he gets up and he gives this talk and it blew my mind basically showing how the drug industry, a lot of what they do is, is essentially fraudulent. They spend twice as much on marketing than they do on research and stuff. And after the first time, I was like, wow. And this guy was like a, a prominent guy. And he looked a bit jaded. It looked like he'd, you know, he'd probably had his own backlash from the drug industry as well. But I was like, this completely then started, you know, help. I started questioning things a little bit more. So that's where I think uh, that stayed in the back of my mind. I carry on, obviously, then I specialize in, in cardiology and, and specifically interventional cardiology. So within cardiology, there's also hierarchy. And intervention was the doing things, the stents, the acute heart attacks. I like the idea of being that person doing that. And I loved it. And I did it for many, many years. So that's, I think, where um, when I started down that track around, I think, and I mentioned this in the documentary, um, I think the first thing was I was becoming conscious of the obesity epidemic and it being an issue and no one really tackling it. And I was trying to understand why that wasn't happening. My dad had a very big interest in public in, in interest in public health. He actually, he was a prolific writer, prolific. He wrote for Guardian, like, you know, the Guardian newspaper, you know, and he was considered, by the way, just to give a background as well, because he did have an influence on me. He was considered in the last three decades before his passing, the most prominent doctor um, who was um, defending NHS values, good quality, universal, free healthcare for all. Right. And the Labour Party, which is the equivalent of the Democratic Party here, gave him the National Doctor of the Year Award. I remember going to see him get that. Right. So he was writing all these articles, but he wrote an article which I actually came across later on. He didn't tell me about it. That basically saying, I think it was like 2011 or something. He said that we need to tax junk food to, to, to solve the obesity epidemic. So he had a public health interest. And also with, with us as well as a family, because he was also sporty, 
he told me to cook when I was 16. I was actually some someone you described as a foodie. Like I liked cooking. Like I was, you know, I cooked almost every day, most days of my life since I was 16 years old in university, et cetera. So I had my own passion about good food. And I was working in the hospital, doing all these late shifts and on calls. And I was like, the food that we're, that, that even for the staff is terrible. So there was a bit of like, what the hell, right? And you also look at the staff and, you know, 50%, and this is actually true data, of, of 50% of NHS staff are overweight or obese. That's still a statistic that's there. It's probably higher now. And I thought, hold on a minute. We have to, we have to start in our own backyard. So the summer of 2011, I wrote to Jamie Oliver and I said, um, you know, uh, sorry, actually 2000 and summer of 2010, actually. I wrote to Jamie Oliver and I, I, out of the blue, you know, I love what you've been doing on, uh, you know, the celebrity chef, what you've been doing on trying to improve school food. Can we do something about hospital food as well? I didn't expect a reply six weeks later, his PA replies, come and meet him, et cetera. But the, so there was that element like on the food side, but around the same time, um, I think 2012, the BMJ, lead editorial in the BMJ by Fiona Godley and, and colleagues, basically was called Too Much Medicine. And I started reading these articles about how there was an over-medicated society. I was also applying it to my own experience with patients on statins. So statins are very well prescribed drug, as you know, and a lot of my cardiac patients were on statins. And I was seeing and diagnosing because I listened to my patients, because this is also important, right? You you know, everything I do, uh, Tro Brian, is very much um, inspired and influenced, if not all of it, from my own patient contact. And, but with the primary motive to be the best doctor I can be, which also means being good communicating with your patients and listening to your patients, et cetera. So I pride myself on that. And then I, I try and expand that out from the consultation room to try and explain what's going on in the rest of the system. And what I found was these patients were getting a lot of side effects. And I said, this doesn't make any sense because the frequency that I'm diagnosing it and getting them off the stand and things get better is way higher than what's being published in the journals. And then when I read the Too Much Medicine piece, I was like, ah, okay, this it's not just me thinking this, there's something else going on here. So that then started me on a journey. And then one of the things that, uh, you know, just to finish on this uh, this part of the, of, of the conversation, one of the things I came across, one of the educational pieces I came across that really blew my mind and made me think, oh my God, we, a lot of these pills are not as effective as we think they are, was coming across a website, and I can't remember who sent it to me, um, called thenNT.com. So everyone can look this up because it's free online. You can see it, thenNT, numbers need to treat.com. And it's an independently evaluated, uh, you know, done by independent doctors. It all, all gets published, I think, through one of the family physician journals in, the, in, in America, peer reviewed. And they look at um, all these drugs, you know, high blood, for blood, for blood pressure pills, type two diabetes, statins, et cetera. And they break down from industry sponsored trials what the actual individual benefit is, the absolute risk reduction. I mean, I read that when I found that statins only have a 1% benefit, for example, in preventing a, you know, a cardiovascular event over five years without prolonging your life. I was like, wow, why, you know, we need to tell our patients this. We need to, un we, you know, this, this is really important information. And and this and one anecdote I'll tell you. I was now working in Harefield Hospital, which is like the premier teaching hospital with the fastest heart attack te teaching uh, treatment times in the country of the UK. I was a re registrar working there, doing all these procedures, you know. And and we had the fastest time where we would treat heart attacks. Uh, the average treatment time called door to balloon time. So when the patient comes in through the door of the hospital with the ambulance to us, us actually inflating a balloon in the coronary artery to open up the blockage, the average time was 20 minutes, right? I'm not blowing my own trumpet here. A lot of it's luck, and the, but I, one of my fastest time through a radial artery as a registrar was 11 minutes, right? So these are things I was doing regularly. And, I and, and, and you've got to remember, these are the guys who have done really when their postgraduate examinations, you know, supposed to be the cream of the cream in medicine. And I remember coming across the NNT on treatment of acute heart attacks with a stent. And the numbers you treat for, for saving a life. And it was 40, right? You have to treat 40 people having an acute ST elevation air myocardial infarct, uh, uh, you know, to, for one to benefit in terms of it being life saving. Of course, there are other benefits, relieving pain. We're doing all the other things, you know, aspirin, whatever else, right? But that actual procedure, and it made me think, wow. And why that's important is I would see my colleagues and some of the consultants getting really angry if, if a procedure wasn't going really well where they should just leave the patient alone, they're gonna be fine. 
you know, perfection is the enemy of good. You don't have to like go all the way down a coronary artery, which is heavily calcified and, and potentially cause a complication. Let's just leave things be. When you have that understanding, it just makes you a little bit more, gives you better perspective. And I remember telling one of my colleagues, really smart guy, another registrar, and I said, man, do you know what the numbers need to treat is? And, and he didn't believe me initially. I said, listen, go and look at this website. And I tell you, for the next few days, he had this face that I can only describe as being crestfallen. Like he was just shocked. He didn't even know this of something that he was trained to do. But he was, you know, I'm just so, so I think for me, when you pull that all together, it then made me sort of shape my advocacy on, on, uh, on, on medicine. But also I was, when I started looking at the nutrition science as well, independently, I also realized that, you know, patients weren't get, being given the right, you know, the right information. There was, a, I mean, there's so much to talk about, Troy, you know this, but, you know, I, I did a deep dive into the cholesterol hypothesis, realized that high cholesterol in its own right is actually not a significant risk factor for heart disease. You could argue it isn't a risk factor at all once you try to correct, correct for triglycerides and HDL. And then realized that, you know, everything rooted in commercial corruption of the information and then indoctrination that went with that. So then it was like, how do we unpick this? How do we change things to actually improve patient outcomes? And I've, of course, I've been doing that now for, you know, um, uh, probably for over a decade. And now and you're uh, looking at absolute risk, relative risk, and you start looking at how they fudge the numbers and you go, oh my gosh, like how, like when you understand it, you say, wow, is that helping? Because it's the same thing that they do what they do in medicine. I go, you you're obese, diabetic, you have all these health problems. They just put you on a statin and you're fine. And I'm I'm absolved of all wrong. If you have a heart attack, it's not my problem. I did the right thing. Right. That's basically what they're doing. And they're not talking about lifestyle at all. And you were the first guy talking about lifestyle. And I remember that. That's how you got on my radar too. I'm you were showing all the vending machines in the doctor's lounge and what they're feeding the patients. You go, Oh my gosh, what are we doing here? This is insane. Right. But it's money too. It is. But even on that point, Brian, you know, in the middle of the pandemic, I, I, I was very vocal, you know, about the making the link between COVID outcomes and, and obesity. And in fact, we know now all the metabolic health problems massively increase the risk of, of COVID death or hospitalization. Certainly in the States, they showed like if you were hypertensive compared to someone's completely healthy, there was like a more than 30 fold increased risk of, of death or hospitalization. And imagine, right. So this is a problem, and let's be honest with with our colleagues, right? Who, and I just I still haven't fully understood the the mindset, other than it being willful blindness, if you like. But you know, in the middle of the pandemic, once we made, you know, I'd become very vocal about, and we've got, there was good evidence showing that there was a link between obesity and, and poor outcomes from COVID. One of the host, teaching hospitals in London tweeted out that they were really happy that they, they there was. I think they they had been donated ten thousand no like a thousand free Krispy Kreme donuts for the staff during when COVID was at its worst and I was like this is totally the wrong message and put a tweet out I was like this is I'm, I'm not gonna you know this is unacceptable right this is it's actually my duty and responsibility to call this out and the backlash I mean there was a lot of people on my side but there were a lot of prominent doctors that were like they didn't get it. And they just thought it was like uh, that I was out of order. And they then thought it was funny to start tweeting pictures of themselves basically eating these donuts in hospital. I was like, we're totally sending out the wrong message here. We actually know as well. We knew, I think, by that stage that if you're admitted to hospital with high blood glucose, even if you're non-diabetic, worsened your outcomes, right? So, yeah. so, so I was, you know, that is just, that is crazy that that's still ongoing. And that I think that represents a huge, deep ignorance that still exists amongst our colleagues about the impact of nutrition on health. And again, they have a grossly exaggerated view of these pills. Yeah, I watched Eli Giroux. He's a hospital doctor. He goes, look, the number one thing I'm seeing is obesity. And he got attacked for like four days on, on Twitter for being uh, fat shaming people. He's like, no, that's what I'm seeing. He was calling out what he was seeing. And I, I sat down with Peter McCullough and three other docs who were like the top docs treating COVID at the time. And I asked him, what's, what scares you the most? High sugar and low LDL cholesterol. That's the people and low, low vitamin D levels. Right. Yeah. And you go, wow. These are the experts. And the, the other guys aren't, they, they haven't treated a patient. They're telling us how to treat this disease process. And you go, this is weird, isn't it? Wouldn't you have a sit down with all the doctors and say, Hey, what's working? What's not working? When Peter McCullough came to down, he asked me, he said, Brian, what's working? What's not working for you? What's the best thing for you? He wasn't telling me what he was doing, right? He wasn't forcing down, like saying, you're going to follow what I do. It's more of a, you know, when someone is open-minded, say, oh, is that working for you? Let me look at yeah, that and see absolutely. what happens, right? Absolutely. Yeah, I wanted, I wanted to come back because uh, 
to to a point it's actually like a just coincidental thing you know you find this website the nnt.com you know right around 2011 2010 2011 you know just a little coincidence at that same exact time you know 2010 I'm an intern in, uh, uh, you know, in the Yale uh, internal medicine residency program. And that was the time when uh, CMS, you know, our central sort of Medicaid or central medical services organization that, that runs Medicaid and Medicare, uh, it had forced a rule on hospitals to report the number of patients and the number of healthcare workers that have gotten the influenza vaccine. And then in the following year, what they did was they they levied a penalty if the rate of vaccination was under 90%. And there was no evidence to support this. And in that year, um, you know, so basically if they were getting paid $100 per visit, you know, it would be $99 if they reported that they, you know, had a patient vaccination rate of under 90%. And then the year after it was if their employees had a vaccination rate of under 90%. And so what happened during that time was the forcing of uh, the influenza vaccine on healthcare workers. And I'm a medical intern. And it's funny, same exact time you're turning to NNT as a cardiologist. I literally went to the NNT.com and I looked up the influenza you know, vaccination rate to prevent one case of flu. And it was something like 500 people, right? So when wow. they, when they, you know, it's, it's maybe even more. Uh, and so when they asked me to accept this mandate, you know, and they removed the personal exemption, like if you just said you don't want it, you know, they removed that. Yeah, I had to uh, actually go talk with my priest about this, and because wow. the only option for me was a religious exemption which has since been removed now in several states, including New York state. So wow. now uh, it's a little, little coincidence, the same thing that, you know, the NNT.com, we should find whoever made that website, you and me, and we should maybe interview them, you know, and we should be thanking them because it sounds like well, they I did. opened our so, eyes. So, no, so I did actually, ultimately, I ended up becoming part of the editorial board for the NNT.com and actually published on, um, on STEM. Because I then wrote this article in JAMA Internal Medicine 2014, The Whole Truth About Coronary Stents. And then I did it. I, so I'm on that site and I was part of the editorial board. Um, and the guy that founded it. You just amazed uh, me you know, more and more, man. What have you not done, Asim? <laughs> well, no, I mean, the thing is, I, you know, what happened was, I'll tell you, is that I thought this needs to get a lot of attention, right? And everyone needs to come. So when the Too Much Medicine article was written, editorial was written in 2012, um, and there was a huge kind of rapid response letters to the BMJ. I wrote the first time I, I, my first, I'd already had a major publication to do with heart stents, right? But one of my first, my first publication in the BMJ was a letter, which got a lot of attention. And, it, and I said, uh, it was some, the title of the letter was something, um, the first step to winding back the harms of too much medicine is, is, is understanding the NNT. So I wrote this thing and it got published in the BMJ online or whatever else. And a lot of likes, you know, and actually it was after that. And I was writing for the Guardian, the Observer newspaper as well. The BMJ asked me to start writing for them. And then by the end of 2013, the piece I wrote, saturated fat is not the major issue. I put the NNT on statins saying we've overcooked millions of people on statins. You know, if you've had a heart attack, your benefit is one in 83 for mortality, uh, one in, you know, um, one in 39 in preventing a non-fatal heart attack but actually a Mediterranean diet <laughs> from one randomized control trial, to be fair, actually had a threefold benefit versus statins in those patients, right? So that was what I put together to give the people a comparison saying, actually, we are the diet side is probably going to be way more effective than, than the, and it comes with our side effects. So that's how I got. And then the that guy who started, the editor-in-chief of the NNT.com, then got in touch with me and said, wow, you know, you've blown our website out of the water because this article, like this BMJ thing got, you know, so many downloads became an international news story. So that's how we connected with him. And then we had, we ended up meeting in New York and then, you know, he he left and then there was another editor that took over and I was on the editorial board. But again, this is also part of part and parcel of the, um, you know, uh, just to be very candid with you guys, I've had lots of different positions, right? Um, in health policy, action on sugar, 
um, visiting professor of evidence-based medicine. I was president of the public health collaboration. Every uh, and even on the editorial board of the NT.com, uh, Tro. And I don't want to name people and point you know p- point fingers. Every single one of those pretty much organizations, um, I was let go of. Not because I did anything wrong, not for any particular reason. They made some sort of excuse, but it was, uh, you know, originally with action on sugar, it was to do with the fact that I was talking about statin over prescription. And one of the lead, I won't name this people, but one of the lead people within that organization, that group that runs it, um, had a patent on the poly pill and didn't want me to talk about statins, even though I was like, I'm only representing action on sugar to my sugar. This is my own separate thing. Suddenly they didn't, you know, I was I was let go of, even though I start pretty much was a founding member of that organization and got them into the mainstream. Um, and uh, and even with the public health collaboration that, you know, the, the whole issue with them started because they got um, they got uh, influenced by external forces around my COVID vaccine stance, even though half of the trustees tro of the public health collaboration did not get vaccinated. And they thanked me because some of them working with the NHS um, I, I campaigned to overturn vaccine mandates for healthcare workers. And then suddenly, like a year later, I was seeing we think we should part ways because they were getting pressure on this whole issue of the vaccine, my stance on the vaccine, even though I said we can keep that separate. So the point I'm making is that, you know, this is the hard part, I think, and the most I have as on a personal level, speaking truth to power is not that big a deal for me when I get attacked by big pharma, big food, whatever, right? The, the smearings of people linked to them. When it comes from your own colleagues and your own tribe, that's particularly hard to deal with. It's hard because these, these outside forces too. And, you know, I mean, when we talked, Azim, you know, I, I took a stance one way on the vax, you took a different stance and I, and I had data based on what I was seeing. So when we had our coffee that morning, I was thinking you were going to come to me and go, Brian, tone it down on this stuff, don't talk about it. And you go, oh, you, you had seen something. So what did you see that yeah. made you go, I'm going to change my stance on this. Like, what was it that that was your trigger right there? At that yeah. Time? So, so uh, Brian, great question. So there's a nuance here as well. So let's go back to, to 2020. I'm the guy writing articles in medical journals, European scientists getting on mainstream TV saying there's a problem, you know, in the mainstream newspapers uh, and linking obesity with COVID, right? So I did all that. And then on the back of that, I wrote this book. My publisher said, I was writing a statement for Eli. I said, pause that. You're the most prominent person in the world, the doctor at the moment, speaking about this link with you know the immune system and, and and metabolic health. Can you write a book in six weeks? And I turned over this book in six weeks, and it did well. It was a Sunday Times best. It's called Twenty One Day Immunity Plan. So I did all of that. But the reason I'm mentioning that is I also had a very good understanding of the infection fatality rate, and I knew that was only really significant for people who were over seventy. And once you got uh, you know under seventy, and that was also the Santa Clara study that was done by Jay Bhattacharya, John Ionidis. Mm-hmm. You know there was a thousandfold difference in the mortality rate between you know being a, a child and being very elderly, right? So, but essentially, you know, and we know this now that if you're under seventy, you know, with no major risk factors, your infection fatality rate, even from the beginning, uh, you know, of, of COVID, was similar to the flu. Okay. So I knew all of this stuff. And of course, knowing all of that made me also realize, well, you know, uh, you know, and I knew vaccines for respiratory viruses aren't particularly effective. Tro's talked about the flu vaccine. It's, you know, I'm not here to tell people not to take it, but the evidence is very weak on just how effective it is. And, um, you know, so I knew all of this stuff. We get, and, and by the way, and, you know, I think for me, there's a lot of personal things that were happening, which kind of blindsided me a little bit. But the first thing that happened is I started getting called, I was being called an anti-vaxxer in the summer of 2020 when the editor of European Scientist, who loved the book, said our best defense against COVID is uh, something like um, optimizing metabolic health and referenced my book, right? And I tweeted that out and there were some prominent doctors who used that to say I'm an anti-vaxxer, right? And I was like, this is just crazy because I'm saying that you should improve your immune system um, you know, focus on metabolic health. I didn't say don't take a vaccine, but that would be a really best, our best defense. That's all I said. So I was like, okay, so that was already starting then 2020. It was a bit odd. We get towards the end of 2020. Of course, the vaccine rollout starts. Mm-hmm. And I'm, you know, lots of stuff going on. Uh, we'll come back to that. But I, you know, I lost Everybody my job. Everybody cheered. Yeah. Sorry yeah. to interrupt the scene. Everybody cheered with just the press release, by the way. All of those doctors who probably said you're an anti-vaxxer, they were all cheering the vaccine. Yes. I remember being there on Twitter yeah. with just a press release from Pfizer. Yes. And I was like, none of you have reviewed that. It's not been peer, through peer review. No data. You don't know anything. long-term. You we didn't know anything. Absolutely. 
So there was so that was all happening. Um, then also on a personal level, I was I was up against it a little bit. I was having a few things going on, especially I was trying to get a job back in the NHS. You know, I, I, I'm not a big on my private work. Things are OK now. But I was having listen, I'll be very candid with you guys. Right. Imagine I'm a consultant cardiologist. I'm doing all these things. Most of my work doesn't pay me because it's activism. That's fine. But I'm now in a situation where I'm having to borrow money from my own father because I, I can't like keep up with my expenses, like as in living expenses, right? So I'm in all of this. I'm trying to get a job back in the NHS. I'm getting told by cardiologists, seeing we know you're great with what you do. You get on with your colleagues, blah, blah. But because in 2019, there was this article, we'll come back to it later, because there's a lot of uh, bit of drama around that as well, published in the Mail on Sunday, because I carried on the, the statin campaign of transparency, basically saying me and Zoe Harkham and Malcolm Kendrick, you know, these, these, uh, this other brilliant GP and, and nutrition scientists, you know, there's a place in hell for us because we say statins don't work because there was all this stuff going on 2019. So I lost my job in the NHS. I didn't say explicitly because I couldn't say that, but a month later, like your service is no longer required. I was trying to get a job back in the NHS and all of the, all these barriers happening and saying, seems because of your statin, this mail on Sunday thing. Okay, fine. So I'm a bit stressed out about that. We get to the end of 2020. And um, now my father who was, as I've told you, was a you know retired GP, very measured guy. You know, he, like many people of his age in his early 70s, had a grossly, we now know, grossly exaggerated fear of COVID. Mm -hmm. But more than anything else, I, you know, he um, was worried that the last surviving member of his family, me, having lost his eldest son, then my mom, we lost my mom at the, you know, in 2018, um, he thought I was going to get COVID and die. And we had back and forth. I was like, Dad, listen, I'm fine. Don't worry about it. He's like, no, no, no. You need to have the vaccine. If you come and help out in a vaccine center here, you can get the leftovers from the beginning. So I was quite reluctant at the beginning, to be honest. Um, and even after the first dose, I remember having an argument with him outside the vaccine center. And he scolded me like I was a, a child. I was, I, was, I was a disobedient child because I didn't feel well after the first one. I didn't, I, I didn't link anything to what I do now, but I was like, oh, I don't really feel like having, and it was like, and I was like, okay, what, well, screw it. I'm going to go and get it done. I get it done, second one. I didn't feel well after it. All sorts of stuff happened to me. But what happened then was, I also realized I didn't necessarily need it, but I thought, okay, well, if it does stop transmission in some way, then I'm going to help, you know, I'm going to need it to protect my patients. And then there was a back and forth going on with a friend of mine who's a film director called Gurinder Chadha. Um, she's made a lot of movies, Bend It Like Beckham's one of them, Blinded by the Light on Bruce Springsteen, quite well known. And she comes to me for medical advice and she was sending me all these blogs. Now I hadn't seen any good, honestly, at that point, and I would normally look for this stuff. I hadn't seen any good, credible person coming out with saying the vaccine's an issue. The the, the BMJ, the editors, Fiona Godley, who are against, you know, against too much medicine, were, were very pro-vax. Um, there were a few blogs here and there, but some stuff was just crazy stuff that was being circulated and saying there were microchips in the vaccine. Yeah, yeah, but, yeah. Uh, and that put me off. That was like, mm -hmm. oh my God, this is like, this is just crazy, right? So I said to Gurinder, I said, no, this doesn't make any sense. Listen, um, I can't be confident on the efficacy, right? I said that because we don't know with all these, you know, these respiratory virus vaccines don't do that well. But I can't see, and honestly, I couldn't even perceive of a problem of harm, right? As a cardiologist, I'm informed by what my patients, I've never seen a vaccine injury in my life. I couldn't see it as being an issue. I could understand why people wanted to wait and I could understand why people under 70 didn't need to have it. And I, in fact, advised people, even though I took it, I was like, you know what? You probably don't need it because you're young and fit, right? So that was even happening then. And then, you know, I she was a bit, she was high risk because of her weight and type two diabetes. So she took it. And then she tweeted out that she'd had it and that she took my advice. Good Morning Britain that knew me then asked me, would you come and speak about the vaccine and vaccine hesitancy? Because people from ethnic minority backgrounds in particular were very low on the uptake. And when you're a public figure and you're, you're Indian origin and blah, blah. And the, I, I never got invited back on because I didn't go on there and start waving the finger. I said, well, I can understand why the hesitancy is there. I said, look at the fraud of the drug industry. I said, you know, prescribed medications, third most common cause of death after heart disease and cancer. But I said, but compared to everything else we do in medicine, I still believe this to be the case traditional vaccines are, the, are safer, right? And that was how it, how it went. And, um, but I'd already started to have my own issues. I went into, uh, uh, I went into depression within a few weeks of having the vaccine. Uh, I couldn't leave my house for a few days because I had no energy. There's all these things which I mentioned to Joe Rogan. So there was something intuitively that didn't feel right. And then, you know, a couple of months later, I meet one of my mentees, brilliant cardiologist, one of the brightest guys I know, like absolute genius in tearing, you know, putting uh, 
unpicking data from from trials and whatever else and can publish in you know high high impact medical journals for fun just by writing articles and editorials right and he said to see he'd not he told me i've not had the vaccine and he said he wanted to wait not because he had any hard evidence of anything he said i was i wanted to wait but i also saw something in the pfizer's new england journal of medicine paper in the supplementary appendix which showed there were four cardiac arrests in the vaccine group and only one in the placebo and he says, it's small numbers, not statistically significant in its own right. But he said, if that's a signal, we're going to have a problem. So then I, that's where, you know, that was there in the back of my mind. We then get to the summer of 2021. One of the most difficult experiences and memories of my life still is, you know, my dad calls me. He has cardiac signing chest pain. He's in Manchester. I'm in London. I tell him to call an ambulance. He calls his neighbors, ultimately has a cardiac arrest and dies. I then get involved in, co in covering an ambulance delay that was being, uh, you know, the, the 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 government and the Department of Health had, had kept from the public for for months. That was happening all across the country, and you know, publish on that and make mainstream gone BBC News talking all about that stuff. But my dad's post mortem findings come back, and initially people were saying, "Oh, don't you know? He's just had a heart attack. What's the point?" I was like, "No, this doesn't make sense." I we you know, I did a calcium score on my dad a few years earlier, right? And it was like 200 and something. So he had like moderate, right? But he then lost weight. He'd quit sugar. He was in a better position. His blood pressure pills had been reduced. So if anything, knowing how coronary disease develops and progresses from a metabolic health point of view, it should have stabilized at the very least. He had critical stenosis. So I was like, this doesn't make sense. Was he really stressed out? You know, I, 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 couldn't, I couldn't understand why. And then November, 2021, for me, that was the light bulb moment. Stephen Gundry publishes an abstract in circulation which reveals that within eight weeks of the mRNA vaccine, and by the way, I'll tell you an interesting story about Stephen because I met him recently to find out what happened with him. And he hasn't, I'm sure he wouldn't mind me telling you this, but his story is fascinating with how he got to this, understood this, right? So he published his paper looking at, um, you know, uh, I think hundreds of his patients, middle age, and within eight weeks of having two doses of mRNA, Pfizer and Moderna, the baseline risk looking at inflammatory markers correlated with heart disease, went from 11% risk of heart attack in five years to 25%. And I was like, Shit. part of my language. I was like, penny drops for me. Okay, one bit of data, but this now for me, being someone that publishes on heart disease being chronic inflammatory condition, this would explain probably what happened to my dad. And if this is real, we will see a signal in the real world. And then I get a Times journalist call, who called me a few weeks earlier saying, we've got an unexplained increase in heart attack since July, 25% increase in hospitals in Scotland. I then get a whistleblower from the University of Oxford that calls me up saying a group of researchers that have accidentally found through imaging that in vaccinated, there is a signal of coronary inflammation, which is not there in the unvaccinated. So for me, there was more than enough data to say, to at least speak out and say, hold on a minute. Can, can somebody look at this? There, there might be a problem here. That's when everything turned. But as with all my other advocacy, everything I've done where I've gone really hard on the mainstream stuff and gotten stuff into the media has always happened from a medical journal publication because I've only felt confident enough to do it and and to and to um, be able to really dig deep and look at the pros and cons of everything I think or, or I'm suspicious of, whether it's about sugar or low carb diets, to do it through a medical journal first. So I thought, let me spend some time looking at all of the information on the vaccine and, and reach out to people who had greater expertise than me in immunology, for example, and figure it out. And then I published in the Journal of Metabolic Health and formerly Insulin Resistance, peer reviewed, still stands up to scrutiny, 2022, and, and and basically said we need to suspend the vaccine basically because the you know from from there's more than enough data to suggest that the harms outweigh the benefits even from the beginning probably for everybody right which is a big statement to make and i lined up everything to hit the mainstream news as i've done before because part of what i do as a, as a public health advocate is understand the media and understand that if i'm going to say something i'm going to throw the kitchen sink and making sure it you know i have a hierarchy like world news front page of British newspapers, if not uh, not the lead story in the, in the in the page three or whatever. And I had, I won't name this person because he's a good guy, worked with him before. He was ready for the exclusive for two months. And on the last day, when the, when the and I told the editor of the journal, hold off publication, we would line it up for this guy to get it in the mainstream news. Because at that point I realized if it's mainstream news in the UK and the mainstream British newspaper, it's game over. The vaccine will be suspended in me. I knew how, I know how these things work. And he pulled back last minute and he came up with some strange excuse saying the British Immunological Society response to your article is this, the British Heart Foundation's response to your article, which is fine. In the past, he's always published their responses because you've got to have balance. You've got to have, well, they're going to criticize. You know, I've had this on low carb diets. Like, doctor, you know, we've got stuff in The Guardian. It was like British Heart Foundation say that his views on low carb diets and cholesterol is dangerous or some sort of bullshit.
like that, right? So I was expecting all that and I was ready for it. Yeah. But he didn't even go and publish the article. And I was like, okay, let me, I, w- I was actually gutted at the point. I was like, cause I'd spent all this time and I said, this is so bad. We, you know, and I was so dedicated to making sure no people, no one else is going to be harmed from this vaccine, COVID vaccine. So then I thought outside the box and I remember a story of, um, you know, an editor of a newspaper in South Africa during the apartheid regime who basically, you know, the rest of the world didn't know what was actually going on. How um, Steve Biko, this young doctor who was pre-Mandela, was this, uh, you know, freedom activist for, you know, uh, for civil rights. And he got brutally murdered in prison and it was all being covered up. And this editor of a newspaper couldn't, you know, he was now being followed. He basically, there's a great movie, by the way, you should watch. It's called Cry Freedom. And he basically escaped South Africa and he said, I can get this into the news in England. He got it to the news in England, explained what had been going on. And then there was huge international pressure in South Africa. So thinking with that mindset, I was like, okay, we're a global community here. I have, I'm known in other countries, Australia, India, I've had mainstream media coverage there. I got it into the Times of India. And then the ball started rolling. Next time in the States, a couple of months later, and I'm going on Tucker Carlson, you know, uh, and I'm being interviewed on Fox News. And I was like, okay, let's just keep this ball rolling. Let's keep the campaign going. You know, I'm for the truth, no matter who tells it. And uh, and that's where we are. <laughs> yeah, under immense pressure, right? I mean, at that time, and you have to look at the zeitgeist of the time. Everyone's like, this is our only way out. The only way we can get back is this is our only hope. And you're dashing their hope, right, by saying, look, there may be problems. And as a matter of fact, I'll tell you, you know, I just had a patient reach out to me I, in 2021. We had a conversation. She goes, doctor, tell me your honest opinion. And I said, well, look, here's the risk. Here's the benefit. Here's what I've seen. Here's what happened to my my two doctor friends. Here's what happened to three nurses that I know. And I explained it to her. She fired me. I just get a call from her last week. And she said, doctor, I'm, you know, I wish I would have listened to you. Right. Oh, wow. Yeah. Her husband has a heart attack three days after his booster. She's diagnosed with metastatic rectal cancer a few days. I mean, uh, you know, after having a negative colonoscopy less than four years ago with no risk factors. And you go, right? And so those kind of things, when you see, you go, all we could do is say the risk and benefit. But at that time in California, the reason I'm now a resident of Arizona is if you said anything negative about the vaccine, you would lose your medical license, right? Yeah. AB 2098 passed. Yeah. And yeah. I was like, you know what? I can't, I, my my obligation is risk and benefits. We have to discuss Absolutely. whether we like it or not. 100%. That's, that's unethical, 100%. right? Well, this is, no, this is a tyranny. This is a medical tyranny. This is unacceptable. It's unethical. Our job, we are there primarily to stand up for patients is to fight back against this nonsense. Absolute nonsense. Unbelievable. Yeah. And, and of course the backlash you know, we've all gone through it, but yeah, there's been a, a, a relentless backlash, which interestingly, you know, before I published my paper at the end of 2022, I started campaigning at the end of 2021 to overturn vaccine mandates for healthcare workers. And what I found very strange is after I pretty much go on, you know, on GB news to talk about this, maybe linked with a heart issue, um, I realized it was a big problem. And of course, you know, the data was coming through about vaccine injury at this point, we knew it wasn't stopping transmission. And then at that point is when they introduced the mandates, which doesn't make sense. And my intuition was, this must be coming from the drug companies, right? And that was proven correct. Because a few months ago, Lee Fang, an American investigative journalist, revealed that during the summer of 2021, after we knew it wasn't, and by the way, the FDA on their website actually put that the, the, the people should be aware that antibody testing does not indicate any immunity from COVID from having had the vaccine, especially if you had the vaccine. So they knew there was an issue that wasn't stopping transmission or infection, wasn't stopping infection. You know, we can argue the toss about, you know, se- preventing severe disease and death. Okay. That's a different discussion, right? But it definitely wasn't stopping infection. Therefore you can't mandate it. And, um, and I, I and then this guy basically, Lee Fang revealed that Pfizer had given tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of dollars in total to various grassroots organizations that were credible to push the, the mandate narrative. So this is all basically being fueled by these, these big companies who, who, who don't really care who they harm with, with their products. I mean, that, that's the problem, that's the issue. But they've captured medical knowledge and they've indoctrinated doctors as well. And I think one of the more difficult aspects of all of this, Brian, around the vaccine is that they then manage this propaganda that if you're questioning the COVID vaccine, you're suddenly, a, a, you know, they use this term, they weaponize this term anti-vaxxer 
which no doctor wants to hear and wants to be part of or being associated with. Well, or and, misinformation. And they did or that dis- very yeah, I'm proud to be called a, a vaccine skeptic. You know, well, being skeptical. Around, I mean, right? if you have planes crashing all around you and you say, hey, there might be a problem with planes, you're not anti-plane. You go, I want to have the safest planes we can. Absolutely. So, when you, when you so we have to fight it, back with this language 100% with this discussion. We have to, you know, so people call us anti-vaxxer. I would say, well, you're a, you know, you're a corruption denier. You know, that you're a vax to... injury denier because we've seen it. And what I, what I saw early on is, you know, I was working on a college campus and I had four students come in coughing and miserable and everything. They were all post they were post vax and they said, well, I can't have COVID because I'm vaccinated. Well, you got four of you in a row. Like now you infected everyone because they had the false belief that you couldn't yeah. get it. So when they were saying at the time, it's 100 percent effective. Well, it can't be because I'm seeing people who are coming in. <laughs> they have yeah. it. You know, or yeah. they test positive and negative and positive and negative on my PCR test. And I'm like, what the heck does this mean? Right. We have a problem. We have to figure this out. But if you mentioned it, you were trying to kill people and you were crazy. But now they're all coming out saying, yeah, that's true now. But four years later, <laughs> right, after yeah. people lost their license. Listen, or investigation. I'll tell you another interesting story, because people say, well, the facts are alone uh, are enough. But the facts aren't, uh, you know, the, the, the barrier to the truth there is primarily psychological, not intellectual. In the summer of 2022, before I published my paper, I'm invited to speak at a, an event taking place at the British Medical Association annual conference. My dad was the honorary vice president. There was kind of a tribute thing to him. And there's a separate group, an organization, which is very prominent called the International Medical Graduates Organization. And there was um, a dinner there and there were I was the keynote speaker. And at the dinner is the chairman of the British Medical Association and the president of the British Medical Association, okay? And some other senior doctors. And I give this talk about, it's called the corporate capture of medicine and public health. And in this talk, I throw in just one reference to the COVID vaccine, on a, which was a preprint at that time, now published in the journal Vaccine, which revealed, according to the reanalysis of the original randomized control trials, you're more likely to suffer serious harm from the vaccine than to be hospitalized with COVID, okay? Which suggests it should never be given to anyone. I just throw in that in the middle of the thing, give the whole talk, it, it gets an amazing response from the audience there, okay? But there is a shock initially because I talk about the fact that the regulator in the UK gets 86% of funding from pharma, right? And the chair, the chair of the BMA didn't believe me in a sense. Like he, was like, he was like, what? Like he didn't know this. And he was a bit like shocked. So he didn't know this. And it was obviously very clear because this was a BMJ investigation, which I referenced. And so this is on the, the, and the conference is ongoing during the day. And this is an evening event. And during the talk, it was very strange. I started talking about medicine and the corruption of medicine. There was a small group of people that left. One of the tables, they got up almost like in protest. It was very weird, right? But everybody else loved the mm. talk. The person who organizes the educational events for the British Medical Association said, it seemed that was a brilliant talk. The feedback's been great. Would you do this for uh, you know online for the BMA members? So remember all this stuff. At the event, I didn't know this was going to happen. I, I was supposed to be given an award because everything got rushed. They forgot, you know, everything got a bit late. Um, uh, it was called the um, uh, IMG, International Medical Graduates at the BMA Conference, um, Champion of Preventative Medicine Award. Okay. And they gave me this award, right? I was like, wow. But the guy who who who, who was the chair of this organization said, Asim, sorry, we were so sorry. We forgot to give you the award. It was supposed to be presented to you by the chairman of the BMA. Um, we still want to get this done and take photographs. Can we, can he do it? You know, can you come before you go home? Can you come to the conference and we'll just do it in the break, you know, the BMA conference. So this guy, the chair comes out, he knows me anyway. He knows my dad, very delighted to give me this award. He said, let's do it in front of the BMA banner. So he's giving me this award, right? And this photographs so I tweeted out saying, honor to get this award from the chair of the BMA, blah, blah, that's it. All very accurate. Suddenly that, oh my God. There is a absolute backlash on Twitter from a lot of prominent doctors saying, how can you give this anti-vaxxer, blah, blah. Very strange, right? This is summer of 2022 before I even published my paper. And by the way, my anti-vaxxer stuff was the fact that I campaigned to help overturn vaccine mandates for healthcare workers. That's it. So all this stuff happens. Now, behind the scenes, I couldn't believe this. I then get these messages um, that evening from the chair of the BMA saying, Asim, can you delete the tweet? All hell is broken loose behind the scenes. This is not an, a BMA award, blah, blah. I said, fine, I'll just, you know, I'll, I'll just reword it saying, well, you know, whatever, which I did all that. They forced the chair of the BMA. Now, how will this happen? I don't know, because he was stepping down to make a statement in the conference to basically publicly humiliate me. So imagine I'm going there. We're mourning the death of my dad a year earlier. We're doing a tribute to him. I'm getting an award. 
I get this award, I'm very proud to receive it. Suddenly it turns into let's humiliate a scene. And the BMA make a statement, you can look this up, basically saying that we dissociate, um, this award was not from us, and we dissociate, and even though my talk was nothing with vaccines, we dissociate any, um, we do not agree or dissociate with the Seymour Hotroni's views of COVID vaccines, something like that, very strange, right? But it becomes, it becomes all hell breaks loose. It turns out that one of the members of the BMA council, I won't name him, and I was trying to figure out what was actually a lead author on a paper funded by Moderna saying we should vac COVID, give the COVID vaccine to children. So you can do the math and figure out what happened. These but, people are bought. Look, the, think... But imagine though, for me, I was so upset. I was so upset. Like, this is like, I, I couldn't believe it. This is my dad was like lived and breathed for the BMA. He was an honorary vice president. He was the first deputy chair who's a non-white person to get to that level. And this is what the f they do. It's absolutely f disgusting. And I tell you, Sam, there's there's two things that I think I I think, you know, one of the reasons why I have so much respect for you and uh, one of the reasons why I think you give me courage is we have two key characteristics that, I, that I'd love you to comment on. One, you can see the problems before most other people. Right. Would you agree with that? You can see the problems before most other people. And then two, you know, um, you know, uh, 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 you're incred incredibly well read, incredibly well. You're you're evidence based, right? And you're dealing with a um, with a profession that tolerates authoritarianism, right? Yeah. So very good point. So very good point. So so you and I and Brian, you're in this boat as well. I think we will always face this adversity, even within our quote unquote own tribes. You know, because we will see things, you know, before other people. So, you know, when you mentioned uh, the public health collaboration, you mentioned the, the NNT group, you mentioned these other groups. You know, I wonder how we can grow as individuals, you know, and I'm, I'm thinking this myself. I'm, I'm actively thinking this. If we are a bit ahead of the curve, like my, my, my son, my eight-year-old son, he knows what's going to happen in a movie before everybody else. I don't know how. He just says it. He calls yeah. it out. It's like, that person's evil. I'm like, how do you know this? Yeah. Some people just have that sense. Yeah. So, it's called intuitive intelligence. Yeah. So what do you, you know, what are we going to do? How yeah. are we going to- no, Absolutely. Gonna Listen, I'm glad you've raised this. So we reach these people. Yeah. True. I know? think what we do is we have to obviously, you know, you, you know, there's an idea here to maybe form a separate organization with the people. I think first and foremost, we need people with the right values. Right. That's the issue in society is that we start from that. The right values, people who are honest, people who have integrity, people who are not afraid, who are ready to take some hits in the, you know, uh, on, on the journey to, to, to spreading the, the truthful message around health. So I think that's one thing that we can do. Um, and there is something in the pipeline, which I will share with you probably a later time once I have a bit more uh, understanding on that, which is based out of America. But I think um, that's what we really, you know, we just have to keep speaking. And I think there's a ripple effect. And I think we've already seen that happening, right? Because there has been a shift in the sense that, you know, uh, there was a survey done, I think, uh, a few months ago in America that revealed that 50% of Americans felt that the excess deaths that were happening were actually linked to the COVID vaccine. So I think that we are in a place where the truth has been disseminated. I don't expect apologies. I don't want apologies. I don't want people to say you were right. I just want people to just get you know get with the get get with the um to understand what's really going on and then we're all essentially moving in the same direction to shift this needle away from this corporate tyranny and and to reverse this pandemic of chronic disease that's all we want because actually history tells us that even when you have people that uh, stick the head above the parapet and whistleblowers you know there's a great book that people can read you should I definitely recommend it called willful blindness written by Margaret Hefferman and, you know, even when people do that, they don't get thanked later on. It's just, it doesn't matter. We, we're not here to get thanked. We just want people to get better. We want to create a system which is actually just, just and true for our patients. That's all. So, um, but we have to understand these barriers to the truth. And that's how we unpack it when we have these conversations with people. When I give my talks, I start with saying, listen, evil is rooted in ignorance, but what's worse than ignorance? The illusion of knowledge, right? And I'm giving these talks to doctors. So we start from that position and then say, well, fear is a barrier to the truth because it makes us more compliant. It inhibits our ability to critically think. That's what happened during the pandemic. And then the second barrier to truth is willful blindness, which is a is when human beings, even doctors, turn a blind eye to the truth in order to feel safe, reduce anxiety, um, avoid conflict, 
and to protect prestige and fragile egos. When you start from that position, suddenly people are like, oh, okay, that could be me. <laughs> Let me listen to this guy, right? And then you walk them through the system failures that got us that were happening before the pandemic. And then I throw the data in about the vaccine. And and it works, Tro. I've given this talk to people who didn't know what I would what they were, you know, I was in this grand round talk in India in one of their most prestigious hospitals. People had been completely indoctrinated on the vaccine message. Pin drop silence at the end of it. The person that invited me to speak didn't know I was going to talk about this, right? got up and says, oh, in that, the penny now drops why my colleague, who's 43 years old, had a stroke a week after the, the COVID vaccine. And they're like, oh, shit. right? So, but we need people's attention and we need to be compassionate and say, listen. And I think for me, I was definitely indoctrinated on the other side. I had arguments with people, one of my best friends, and he didn't have any good evidence, but he was like, I see him, I want to wait. We don't know the long-term effects. And I remember saying to him, said, what do you mean? Like growing two heads and I actually hung up on him. Like I got, I was like, this is just, this guy's crazy. Like what the hell There's no, we're, we're still good friends, right? He's one of my best friends, but I understand. And I go into that conversation saying, listen, we're all capable of this. We're all in different, different times, different journeys on different subjects. We just have to understand ourselves a bit better so that we can then, you know, not continue to live our life in darkness because that has no meaning. Yeah, and I've I've always seen you that way as a patient advocate. When you said, "Hey, I think it's like we're none of us knew what was coming. We didn't know how deadly this thing. We were in a crazy time." So to call you anti-vaxxer when you got two shots in your arm, if you were anti-vaxxer, you never would have gotten in the first place, no, right? Oh, it's and just so a propaganda thing. You it's thought it was the right thing, thing and yeah. the propaganda was there, and we were all sitting on the fence going, gosh, which way is this going to go? We don't know what the mortality is going to be. But then the more we saw stuff and go, wait a minute, like all of us knew about natural immunity. If you already had it, yeah. right? They didn't take that into factor at all. And go, how can you not take that into factor? Like, we know that. We know if you get the flu this year, you don't get another flu shot. You already had it, right? Completely. So, so these kind of things of the history of medicine that all doctors, hopefully, are trained on these things, patient autonomy, right? <laughs> In Absolutely. Important sense. All these things, they violated all of I can't think of any. I, I put it out there. Is any, are any of these not violated in, in the last four or five years? We violated every single yeah. basis of our Hippocratic Oath. We, we, we violated 100%. them all. And if you did, you were an, a terror. They said you're a danger to medicine. <laughs> it's like, well, I'm holding up holding what we're supposed to do, right? Isn't this yeah. where we're supposed to be? But the pressure and the heat and so many good docs, I mean, they're suffering now. They're, they yeah. they did what they thought was the right thing, you know? And Absolutely. it's, it's yeah, hard. I and think I think it's hard for doctors is... to see bad outcomes. if But, you but the that. longer the longer this carries on, Brian, the more the distrust, right? So there was this uh, uh, publication recently showing that in April 2020, um, public trust in America and doctors was at all time high. I think 72%, very high trust. Now it's dropped to 40%. And that's what I talked to Jay, Jay Bhattacharya about this. And he was like, Asim, of course, that's what happens. You tell people this vaccine is 100% effects, safe and effective. It's not, you're not going to get the infection. Then people go, like, and like, of course, the, you know, the trust is going to go down. But there is a solution. We are taught in medicine as well. When you make a mistake, when something happens, you apologize to the patient. You explain what happened. But what patients want more than anything else, they want you to say, listen, I'm going to make sure this doesn't happen again. And this is, I'm going to make sure there are more checks and balances so that nobody else suffers in the same way you did. And most patients accept that, Brian, right? So the longer, we can't keep burying our heads in the sand here. There needs to be a kind of a moratorium. There needs to be a mea culpa. But, you know, patients are forgiving if they know that your intentions were pure. And most of the doctors behind this, absolutely, their intentions were pure. But we were being played by an entity that is psychopathic. And that is Big Pharma. I think people don't understand that. You know, they hear us talk and it's like, no, they're out to, it's a, it's a, the, the best way to solve this problem. And I'm sorry it came from Bobby. It's uh, bring back liability. If you bring back liability, yeah. this solves a lot of the problems. Bring back liability. You'll never get a rush vaccine again. Absolutely. Bring back liability. You will get longer trials. Bring back liability. Yeah. It's a simple, easy solution. 100%. And and in and and look at what they did in diabetes, which I think was a great thing after Avandia. And this is all Paul Thacker, who is in your documentary. Everybody, there's another plug to the documentary. Go get the documentary. Go to the show notes. Get the documentary. Paul Thacker, the investigative journalist who was in the Senate hearings back in in uh, 2010, um, he, because of him, now the draft the guidance to industry. We, you know, any drug that's approved for diabetes requires an outcomes trial because of him. 
right? And this is yeah. just the beginning. We need to we need to expand that to all cause mortality for all of these, right? So we can definitively say this medication will save lives or not, this vaccine will save lives or not. So I think you know these are the simple, easy things. Yeah, absolutely, hundred percent, hundred percent. Yeah. Yeah, and we when we really had to take out these quotas and all these like you know I just I don't know if you both saw but a, a healthcare system was bonusing doctors like whoever saw the most patients in a day was getting rewarded and they were cheering each other on oh I'm gonna see thirty five patients I'm gonna see eighty patients like that's not good medicine guys and then when we look at this if you weren't getting a certain percentage of your patients vaccinated you weren't getting your bonus and we're talking two hundred dollars per patient right so you have. 2,200 patients, that's half a million dollars you're kissing goodbye if you don't get them in there. And that was never disclosed to patients. These kind of things, you think, gosh, dang it, we had a lot of financial incentives, not to be honest with our patients. And we're, that's like me selling you a drug and I'm making money on it, right? Then I lose my credibility, whether you need it or not. Sure. So I think there's so much of that, this conflict of interest. And the other thing that you did, and I think it was called License to Kill, maybe. You were giving a talk before some big government body, and you were talking about when George Bush got his stents put in. He was asymptomatic, rode his mountain bikes through there, and you're like, that's malpractice. Like, he was asymptomatic. You're not making yeah. him survive. And I had never heard that before. And I was like, wow, that's yeah. pretty crazy. Putting yeah. a stent in if they're asymptomatic is, is malpractice. Well, a lo lo lot of those, that that, that also highlights the, the, and that's, that's when he was president, right? That this medical misinformation goes all the way up you know, to the, to the president. So we're all, the whole of society is a victim of it, if you like. And it's time to expose the, you know, these commercial distortions of scientific evidence is like, that is now the default, you know, most medical knowledge is under commercial control, but most doctors don't know that. And of course the public won't know it either. And that then comes to, you know, you talked about liability, um, Troy, I'm completely hundred percent agree with you, but I think what needs to go further is that now, given the history of the fact that big pharma have killed millions, there's no doubt, even this is pre pre COVID, they've killed millions of people with with you know from the harms of their drugs, which were known about, and they didn't disclose. They should no longer be allowed to you know test their you know they, independently. They, they should no longer be allowed to test their own drugs. They can develop drugs, but they need to be independently designed, the trials conducted, analyzed, whatever. It's 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 a no brainer for me. And if we get and and if their drugs are so great, then we're going to see from those independent analysis how great they are. And that we're going to know the true benefits and harms. So I think it's game over for them. And it has to be. They, they, they've got away with murder for way too long. This is murder. It's mass murder, as far as I'm concerned. And, and we should just say no. As doctors of the profession, it's time for us to just say no. We're not going to comply now with any drug that comes out from the drug companies that has not been independently evaluated. We're not going to give these drugs. Or if we give the drugs, we must tell the patients, by the way, these psychopathic entities that have produced these drugs um, who are funding the regulator have given us this information that we're supposed to believe. This is what they're telling us. I'm very happy to give you the drug if you want it, but just know that. Yeah, how no, is it that they're that not that's... disclosing? Tell, tell me why. Can you please tell me why I'm wrong? Please, please tell me why what, what I've said is not the right way to move forward. Please. So no, I mean, you made this clear in the documentary, which, which you know, it, it's we need a change. You know, we're desperately need change. We need to go back to, hey, actually reduce stress. And uh, the last part of that documentary just really moved me, you know, these studies that I would have never thought, and you all, I'm not going to give, give it away, but you all got to go watch it because we need to get back to the root cause, you know, the community, oh. uh, the, the, the lowering the stress, the walking, the movement, the, the real food, you know, getting out in the sun, talking with people, laughing, uh, having a bit of faith, you know, meditation, prayer, journaling, you know, these are the simple stuff you know, we give medications and then we 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 stop as doctors really thinking uh, clearly, which is you have a human in front of you that needs help with the human experience, not you have a human in front of you who's sick and needs a drug in seven minutes. Right. And I think um, I think that, you know, that's what the you know, when I walked away from the documentary and I, you know, what I felt was, you know, we need to do better to get back to the things that matter, because this is a cluster of, f excuse my language, sorry, yeah. Jack. It is a cluster f of, of regulatory capture. And uh, to be able to change the incentives may take years. To be able to change the financial structures may take a yeah. long time. Yeah. Um, but you know what? You want to change medicine? Make sure, if, the, if your patients die, you lose money. In one month, you see people start living longer. You know, your patients are getting depressed, you have to pay for it as a doctor.
you will see the mental health epidemic disappear. Yeah. Right. And we need to fundamentally rethink our yeah, whole we, system. And I, don't, I think it's going to take too long. It's a huge thing. And then the Piapi diet you want to talk about, you want to talk about the Mediterranean, the diet or the lifestyle? Like when people help each other, you know, Rosetto, Pennsylvania is a perfect example. You look at these guys had high cholesterol, high sugar. They smoked, they drank, they're Italians, they're eating Italian food. But they weren't dying at the same rate as everyone else of heart disease. Why? They had social connection and they, the Absolutely. grandparents lived with the grandkids and they had a purpose in life and people loved each other. And that's that's really what this come down to. You're not going to get that through a drug. <laughs> Ain't going to happen. Yeah. yeah, 100%. You can't solve these social problems with pills. You know, and I think that also highlights something else uh, uh, that is a myth that needs to even be busted amongst our colleagues is that at least 35 to 50 percent of your health is actually socially determined so these are the conditions in which you are born grow live work and age and then the drivers of those conditions so it goes back to everything you've just said but we need to create systems and a culture that allows those you know these things to flourish more eat real food more connection with with each other um you know and uh and, and the simple things about walking being out all that kind of stuff those, those are the real that though that those are the ingredients of of real true good health. Amen. So true, man. And it's so great to have you on again. Thank you for all you do. Thank you, you surprised me. me. Like I remember talking to you, I'm like, ah, he's not gonna do this thing. And then when you did, I was like, wow, this is and I was watching one thing after another after another. But the courage to be the only guy. And they go, you know better than the FDA, the CDC, World Health Organization, all this stuff. And you're like, yeah, I do. I'm seeing it. I know what I'm seeing at clinic. Because most of those people have never treated a patient or they're not treating a patient right now, right? And they may hand down these guidelines and, and us frontline doctors seeing what we're seeing and we know what we're seeing. So we're telling the truth. Say, here, here's my chart. You want to see it? Want to see yeah. what we're doing for medical misinformation? We Absolutely. have the data. <laughs> it's there. Yeah. And they're just unwitting. I honestly think they're well-intentioned. They're just unwitting puppets to corporate psychopaths or a corporate psychopathic entities. They haven't realized, they haven't got the diagnosis right. You know, this is about diagnosing the root cause of the problem is that the, you know, the, the, the current corporate capitalist structure or the system basically, you know, means that the interests of these big corporations, big pharma has now become very narrow to just making money. Um, and they don't care who they deceive in the process. And we need to change the, the, the system, um, you know, with probably through legal measures to make sure that that is no longer the case. That's how we solve these problems. Yeah. The, you know, the, the issue, the way I see it, I look and I sit back and th it's kind of like your dad being outnumbered by 10 guys. You look and you go, well, these guys own the judges, they own the courts, they have the money. Like w your side doesn't have the money to say, okay, we're going to stand up to this thing. And so they could just, you know, I've talked to people that have been in business together and he goes, I could outlast them. I have more money. You, you may not be right, but you have more money and you outlast them because the other guy can't keep paying his legal fees and forget it. I'll settle with you. I'm done. Even though they're right. <laughs> Do you see what I'm saying? Yeah. Yeah. It's a Absolutely. tough problem. It is a problem, but I think, um, you know, we have this, you know, there's a guy called Matthias Desmet, who's a psychology professor, academic, brilliant man. Um, and he came up with this term called mass fusion. I think Robert Malone called mass fusion psychosis mm -hmm. in, in Joe Rogan's podcast. But essentially what he says is when you have these historical authoritarian type regimes, you know, whether it's Nazi Germany or, or, or somewhere else, he says that the, you know, the, the antidote is basically just, it just takes a few people who are willing to speak out and speak the truth from a from a place of sincerity that has a huge resonance and is very very powerful that's something money can't buy and that's how you dismantle this so we just need more people speaking out and it will we will change the system for sure well we, 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 that's it. we should end with your gandhi quote when they first they laugh at you oh yeah of course well yeah first first <laughs> so yeah this is again a sign of progress when you're getting it so first they ignore you then they laugh at you then they fight you then you win so once we're getting attacked and the backlash is coming, certainly I felt that I felt that when it with sugar, with cholesterol, statins, low carb diets, I mean, all that stuff, we've made progress, right? But the real progress only happens when we get to the root of changing the economic system that allows this sort of oppression to happen, increases inequalities. Um, and, uh, you know, and, and again, it's about getting, making sure this gets out to as many people as possible. Noam Chomsky says, you know, the general public, and I would say doctors, don't know what's happening and they don't even know that they don't know. Right. And, and these big corporations exert their power by keeping this conflict latent, by keeping it hidden. They don't want these conversations to be like we're having now to be getting out to the public. We have ripple effect. We have truth. We have sincerity on our side. We have integrity on our side. That's what people really want. 
and you will see this carrying on. There will be backlash, but you know, as Jordan Peterson says, you know, it's not safe to speak the truth, but it's even less safe to not speak the truth because the problem isn't going to go away. And the longer you don't speak the truth, the bigger it's going to get. So we just have to just take it on the chin, you know, and that comes back to, you know, basic values of, you know, the, um, the, the, the cardinal virtues from ancient wisdom, wisdom, um, you know, courage, justice, uh, courage is the most important of all those virtues because without courage, you can't practice any other virtue consistently. So. Guys, I need to step out. This has been awesome. Yeah, no, thanks, Dan. Thanks, yeah, for thanks for joining us. Thanks. I have waiting to see you. So I, I yeah. absolutely love it. Guy, absolutely love it. Absolutely love it. Everything you said was amazing. Yeah, we'll do this again, man. I'm glad you didn't stay in your lane, right? Like you, you stood up for the right, and and that's one thing we'll always respect about you is like, hey, there's gonna be a cost. You know, I don't have a huge family. You lost your family, and like you're got like I'm gonna be a warrior in this fight, and so that's that's shown up. And so I think you know, and I and I was wrong because I said it would take five years for people to appreciate what you've done in a lot of these other docs, but like Jay, Doctor Jay, Vitacharia, and you, and all you know, it's like it didn't take five years. It was a lot shorter than that. So yeah. thanks for all you've done. Thank and, you. And, uh, I appreciate yeah, it guys for standing all in right. the storm. Lots yeah. of love. Thanks, thanks, everyone. All the Blessings, stuff. man. Out, we'll talk to you soon. Movie, watch the documentary and we'll put all of it in the first show. First do no farm. P H A R M. If you enjoy the show, please consider supporting us on Patreon by going to lowcarbmd.com.